Hey folks, it's uh, Classic DM, and we're going to go through Pathfinder's new remaster release of the GM Core. And I want to adopt the video from an interesting perspective, like, do you need the book? And there actually is a lot of really strong, powerful content in the GM Core. Of course, the Player Core, there's another video we made for that. You can go through that. We're trying to get bogged down on any kind of unnecessary details. I want to put this video together so you can, like, I want to buy it, but do I really need it kind of a situation. Like, what is actually in the book that's going to be useful to you as a, a game master? Um, this book is really not useful for any players in any way shape or form unless you're just a player that also gms from time to time so we're going to go ahead and just jump right in here we go so you know the gm core is broken down into five major chapters uh chapter one is strong really helpful chapter two is great if you're building your own world chapter three once again they just keep throwing these age of lost omens half-baked cliff note chapters into every single one of these books i know why they do it they do it because hey this is our world we've got a world waiting for you when you've been in the game system for a long time, Pathfinder 1, Pathfinder 2, you're like, oh my god, can you guys please stop putting this post-it note in every single book? But the book is designed to last for all time and introduce new players to the game, so it's always going to have this introductory slash... Don't forget, we've got a game world type junk that's in here. But if you're a GM, you know you know that happens all the time, so you can pretty much kind of ignore it. I mean, that's about, you know, what is that like... From page 142 to 172, it's like 30 pages. So that's about 15 pages of flipping. It's okay. If you've never read the book before, you're glad it's there. But the subsystems chapter, I don't like this kind of stuff. Uh, this is all alternate roles for victory points and leadership and duels and reputation. It's neat and it's cool and sure it is game mastery stuff for a game master who thinks about, hey, you know, I really want to run an adventure. I've got a chase scene. I want to do exploration. I've got vehicles and ships and, and Roman chariots or what have you. But I don't really think it needs to be in this book. I think this book really, in my personal opinion, uh, should be in a separate book of alternate rules. And they should expand it to make it much more robust than what's in here, which is about 20 pages worth. The treasure trove is cool. I mean, even in the old classic AD&D you know, books, how many times do you remember flipping to the page that has the recorder of you seen and the sword of cast on it, the artifact weapons? You're like, wow, having treasure, fantastic. That's one of the things about Pathfinder 2nd Edition that I actually is, think is a weakness is the whole player-crafted rune system. But hey, it's their game. They made it the way they want to make it where players need to craft and upgrade etchings on their weapons. Um, I always found it kind of bizarre that random ding-dongs are doing random, doing very expensive uh, enchanting onto their weapons. I was like, what? It's not Diablo. But anyway, that's just me being old school and grumpy. So, But Chapter 5, 1, 2, and 5 are really, really strong. And there's some details in here that would be very easy to miss, especially if you're going to be creating your own creatures uh, hazards sure but things with different types of environments campaign structure uh, adventure design all those details i think are really really good and let's just flip through that real quick so the first chapter is not as insulting as the player core chapter um, it does have some little uh social woke whoop-de-doo in here which i'm not a huge fan of but they had that even in their original game mastery guide if you go back to pathfinder one i mean the game mastery guide introduction is like six pages of like what to do with people with with uh issues and problems and things they have reversions to and it talks about slavery and sex and all this kind of business i i can understand why they put that stuff in these books because times have changed you know, when we were playing AD&D a long time ago, let me show you the pages I'm talking about here. This objectional content, Pathfinder baseline, tools for responsible play with lines and veils, and the X card, tap, 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 and all this kind of information, you know, talking about torture and rape and harm to children and sexual abuse. If you're a parent and your 12-year-old boy or girl is reading through this book and she happens to look at it, you'd be like, what the hell kind of game is this? So I think it's actually a disservice to have this kind of content written in the game. Let human beings and players understand and figure out their own uh, social graces and boundaries in their own game. But the reason why this stuff is here is because people are playing with noobs that they never met before, strangers. Playing with strangers online. Playing with strangers who have joined your game because it's hard to get a game anymore, right? And with the internet, everyone's got tons of video games and things to do all the time. But when you are in a modern world and you're trying to get a game going, you know, sometimes it's really hard to find players. You might just be playing with people that you meet at the game store. Like there's a game store here where I live that they constantly have like 20 tables full of people playing all kinds of stuff. But they're not playing Pathfinder, unfortunately. They're playing everything else. But that's why this stuff is here. But... I want to make another video that talk about this from a philosophical perspective without just picking on Paizo because their work is really good and I have huge respect for what they do. The, the preaching in this book and the preaching in D&D &D has gotten so soft that it's putting too much pressure 
on a game master, which might be a 12 year old kid or a young 18 year old to become an executive CEO management level human being psychologist slash parent. And that's just too much in my opinion. You should not expect or throw the massive level of responsibility upon a young person playing a tabletop RPG game the way this book pushes you to do so. Turning you almost into the Stalin of the social uh, perspective of the game. But ignore that because, you know, compared to the Game Master Guide from Pathfinder 1, which did this for like seven pages, this is only just like a couple of columns. So you know how to run your game. If you've got a, a consistent group you're playing with or if you play online, you figure it out, whether you play D&D &D or anything, it's how to deal with people that are trying to have romantic sexual relationships with other players or how to deal with people that use objectional language or when you're in a game store, the one fool at the table, slug a mountain dude that laughs out loud all the time that won't pull his pants up. You know, you have all these weirdos sometimes in the TTRPG world that are younger people who are still trying to find their way in the world haven't really matured 100 percent and there's nothing wrong with that because these games are about having a great time and having a lot of fun and doing stuff socially with other people the only way to learn how to behave and act like a respectable human being is to interact and make mistakes around other people unless you have great parents all right that's enough of that let's move on now so you're a gm you want to buy this book you're like okay what's good here you know, it gives you suggestions on how to run things like Session Zero and building your own adventures. And this stuff is like, yeah, okay, you should probably read it once, right? You don't have to necessarily come back and refer to this. And you'll probably, if you've GM'd at least 10 to 15 games, this is all boring to you. Like, you don't, you have your own way of doing things and your players like it, right? And you already know how a hero point works and that kind of stuff. But if you only played a couple of times and you're transitioning from being a player and you kind of want to, you know, boom, dude, will you GM our game this weekend? The, the regular GM went off to college or whatever. You, get, you need to understand, like, what is metagaming and, and what's false information and what kind of special circumstances should I use in my game? So it is good that that content is in here because it reaches a large audience. And I think that's very, very important. Um, if you are an expert, as with anything in life, you already know this stuff and you don't need to read it. So is the book going to be useful to you if you are an expert? Yes, it will be. Because once you get past this very introductory stuff about, you know, saying yes, but and house rules and distractions, and interruptions in the game that you already know how to do, right? Then you start getting into the point where it gets into uh, uh, much more useful stuff called running encounters. And this is the part of the book where it really gets into high gear. Um, this is going to give you a fantastic write-up from the developers themselves that talk about how to do initiative with hidden enemies, alternate initiative ideas, batch initiative, putting players on a map, how to set up miniatures, speed of play, complexity roles, aid, ready, and seek. Like, you need to know this. Like, and if you haven't been GMing a lot, if that's even a word, GMing, <laughs> if you haven't been playing a lot and you're going to come to Pathfinder Remaster or you're coming from D&D 5th Edition or 3.5 or 4, wherever you're coming from, um, you're going to need to know this stuff, right? And if you're already a super amazing amazing badass GM anyway, you just need to kind of flip through this real quickly and see if anything really changed from the old days. But I found this section to be very, very useful because I don't GM Pathfinder 2E as I do a lot of the other games, including my own game, right? But every now and then I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, the whole ready action, Jesus, I forgot about it. Because it's not in any other game, right? This is a really important thing to remember. So this chapter, this section here called Running Encounters is really, really good. And then of course they go on and talk about running, uh, well, how to end the encounters when people are all totally part of kills. I never understood that. I won't get off on a tangent too much. It was like, how do you have a total party kill when you can run away and there's things you can do to get the hell out don't let your health get so low you guys need to have keep yourselves up when things start going bad you should know five melee rounds before it's going to happen and have a plan but advanced pvp players like myself and stuff in the video game industry we already understand chain assisting and healing and, def and defending and moving and i mean look how far you can move with your stride and you can just basically kite and separate in different directions and make the enemy choose one of you and start shooting in the back those kind of advanced tactics don't happen in a TTRPG table because everyone thinks they have to fit the game on the table directly in front of them. And if they're not playing with theater of the mind, they feel like they're trapped in a room and can't move off the grid and move off the table. A great GM allows that stuff to happen. Anyway, so there's stuff in there about that. Now, the Autos talk about how to run exploration, which is really important. Uh, running combat is more like gritty nuts and bolts and all these darn rules and all these different feats and how to do the different saving throws. That's where the game gets bogged down. Pathfinder 2nd Edition is very, very, um, everything is covered. I don't want to say it's math crunchy. It's got some good basics to it. It's not as, not as formulaic as 4th Edition is, and it's certainly not as straightforward and, and retro as AD&D because everyone has feats, right? 
But running exploration is really important because a lot of times that's where the sense of discovery is going to happen. That's where the players are being extra careful or they're not being extra careful and they're bumbling into things. So the, the how to run exploration chapter, that's all part of chapter one, it's a subsection, is really, really good. Um, f uh, fleshing out exploration is nice because this is one thing that's missing from a lot of game mastery guys is the creative things that you need to imbue upon a game master. You, know, you don't just get up there and start acting like, uh, a drama queen and describing the towering trees and dense undergrowth and verdant canopies. Like, who talks like that, right? But they give you some quick environmental detail phrases you can do. You can talk about oppressive humidity or still air or the grasses waving gently. These, you know, narrative elements and narrative voice type things are good little buzz phrases for someone to kind of paint a picture. And this is really, really good. They put this in here because they're teaching you as a GM, hey, don't forget all the five senses. When you describe to someone, someone's listening to what's going on in the world, whether it's powdery snow or un stable rubble that stuff makes a difference because you're crystallizing someone's imagination at the table as you're reading it there's not only really really advanced gms who have lots of photographs and pictures and concept art to work with have a picture and say it looks like this room right but when you talk about bare cliffs and slopes littered with scree like you might have a player table doesn't know what scree even is so this is really really good the exploration mode and exploration activity section of chapter one is very useful setting the party orders another element they talk about and resting that's good hey look there's a table can you believe it <laughs> so it's not just preaching it's also giving you some ways to handle this kind of stuff for time like how much time it takes how many hit points you get back for your constitution modifier etc so that's really good running downtime I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about running downtime because I don't like it. It's just a personal preference of mine. I don't think downtown needs to be run at all. Um, I don't think players need to be advancing a career, making a bunch of gold at the local Buxting on the corner of, of Castle Greyhawk while you're not playing the game. You're at their adventure. You're still trapped in a dungeon somewhere. You're not running a game as absentee gaming. But in their game, they do allow a downtime system and they tell you how to run it and how to set up the goals, what some of the tasking events are, like put on performance for a patron for another place. Like I'd rather actually play that, another plane, excuse me, I'd rather have that session play out like on the table to be interesting, even if it's just with that one player on the side, uh, even just in a conversation buying and selling items. So they give you everything you need to know to run how to downtime. So at this point, you're like, okay, we've got running encounters, we've got running exploration, we've got downtime. These three elements are kind of blended together to become the pathfinder. You're doing A, B, or C, right? No pun intended. But then we get to the difficulty chat. This is where it gets gritty. And this is really good, really useful. It doesn't take many pages to give you the kind of cool tips that you need about minimum proficiency and group attempts to get those DCs by level or simple DCs you can just pull out of a hat when someone's trying to do something like, I'm trying to, you know, they're trying to lift a window that's sealed. They want to kind of break the rod that's holding the seal in a double hung sash window and open the window very carefully. And it's been raining outside. So if you're a real hardcore GM, you know that like when things swell up, and it's going to be hard. And as you slide the, the window up, does it make this scraping, squeaking sound? Or is it just so much stuff you have to put too much force in? And it goes, bang! Like, you want to, well, it made a loud noise. I need to give a simple DC to see whether the guard that's two halls away heard this. Because that's not covered in the rules, right? They don't do a lot of hearing checks and stuff. So this is really, really useful, the difficulty class section. You can also go to How It's Played YouTube channel and see the world's most elaborate explanation of how DCs work in the game. But this is always great because... When their books are laid out with the burgundy font and with a light green font, this header hierarchy of fonts really helps you find particular things and how to set up a DC for it. And creature identification skills or call knowledge considerations. This is really good GM useful information. You know, if you already have the Game Master Guide from Pathfinder 2nd Edition and you are a really, really scholarly GM, you probably would love to read this again because it's fun to see things restated in a different way. Rewards is a really good section too, and we're still in chapter one, right? Remember I said that chapter one and chapter three and chapter five are the most valuable ones, the other ones are kind of fluffy. Um, this has got great XP awards. This is one of the biggest problems you'll see on Facebook and people talking and Reddit. It's like, my party did this, I'm not sure how much to reward them. And people are like, oh, I do milestone. Everyone's got a way of doing it. But they give you a great starting point here considering like the adversary level and all this kind of stuff. So this is really good. It's, of course, they talk about hero points. And treasure. Oh, party treasure by level. This is fantastic. There's more of an emphasis on treasure in this version of Mass Finder than there was Pathfinder than there was before. And I'm glad that they've done that. In the previous version, there was some treasure, but it wasn't a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of robust information for you as a GM to create massive treasure tables. So this is really useful, very helpful. So these sections still in chapter one, you know, is still fantastic. Good game mastery guide information. Good, you know, concise descriptions of how to buy and sell items and how much things are worth and stuff like that. 
building games. This is really good. If you are a game master, you always want to make your own stuff. I write adventures. I've been running my own adventures for eons. I run published adventures too. It's I'm a, I'm a, I'm a game designer in the game industry. We've been creating stuff since Doom 2 and, and Unreal 1 and Unreal Tournament. So you, if you're a creative person, you know it's always fun to have a book that you can go take a look at that talks about different types of uh, creative things you should do, like the structure of the campaign, how to design the adventure, encounter design, variant rules, afflictions, environment, hazard, building hazards, building creatures, building items, building worlds. This is like the Traveler, you know, uh, Worlds and Adventures book, how to build stuff from nothing. Chapter two is fantastic. I'll just flip through it real briefly here so you can kind of see the pages if you haven't bought the book yet, like goals for villains, the next campaign dealing with fa failure. Very well written, really, really good. I love the adventure design section. You know, you should test yourself sometimes and adopt someone else's, you know, a dungeon crawl versus a gritty adventure versus high adventure versus horror. And say, yeah, I was making a horror adventure, but I didn't do something for two sessions. I made it a one shot, like with the uh, uh, Scarecrow's Lament adventure I did, right? Which is kind of a Village of Hamlet meets Sleepy Hollow kind of a vibe, right? So this is a really, really strong section. I'm really glad they put this together. I've never seen anyone phrase things this way, a really useful and structural way to set up adventure design without being so formulated, just rolling on tables like the Mark Miller stuff in Traveler, right? So this is really, really good. Um, fantastic, well-written, got interesting new artwork in it. Great, and encounter design, wow. This is what you really need to have as a game master. Setting up the encounter, how difficult it's gonna be. W wonderful chapter, really, really great. Love it, absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. This stuff is really good. Variant rules, uh, it just it depends. Some people are big into variant rules. Some people just change them on their own. But they have all kinds of interesting details in here, like devastating attacks or defense potency. And these things are really interesting. The zero level characters, like farm kids, like this one here, it has a shirt on. This is all useful for you because they don't really know what you're going to do. You know, proficiency without level and you know, creature experience at no level how to adjust the encounters, these kinds of things, simple DCs with no level associated with anything, adjusting the treasure. So you are gonna have situations where someone's maybe running like a town adventure and you've got a lot of zero level NPCs everywhere and interactions or things are happening. Like how do you have a bartender or a barmaid or someone staying in the, in the adjacent room be able to hear something that you've done or be able to tell that what you're doing is very sly. You know, there's lots of ways you could have a game, a game session where you need those additional little dirty details. So how do I approach this? If I make something up, it might make it up too hard. So that's really good. The afflictions is like a big set of alternate uh, bad things that can happen to you, like curses and stuff. It's great that it's here. This is the strength of the whole system. You know, every single one of these things have a special fancy name, just like you would see in an ability in an MMO or an RPG game. So they're very nice to have these here, like level 19 curses and stuff, thieves, retribution. This punishment causes you to lose something dear to you wherever you rob or steal. If you have nothing to lose, the curse exacts its punishment upon your body instead. Saving throw DC 39 fortitude effect. Each time you steal something, you lose something even more valuable. This item is whisked away and can't be found again. Really interesting. I can see players being upset when that happens to them. But this is what they're supposed to be. Like if you do something, a curse is put upon you or an affliction is happening from open a tomb. These things are great to have. I think it's fantastic. You can take your own personal creativity and apply it to your game session as you think is necessary. Of course, they have diseases in here as well. Environments is always nice. You're running an Arctic adventure. You want to you know, figure out how the snow is going to work. You have something with light undergrowth versus trees and canopies or sand. This is really good, good old-fashioned AD&D style Game Master Guy without the sleep tables from Gary Gygax. Really great to have this environmental section here of Chapter 2. Very useful. Doors, gates, rooftops, urban crowds, everything you need to run anything, anywhere. Really good, useful information. I'm so pleased to see them put so much time and energy into this section, especially the temperature effects. Even when I was doing the Indigo Aces way back in 2019, I created my own pr uh, system for describing how getting you know heat exhaustion and how you can become dehydrated, what happens to you when you get dehydrated with medical terms because there was nothing in the Game Master Guide, which hadn't even been released yet, to tell me how to handle it. So I had to make up something based on real-world common sense. Very, very good. The hazard section, I'm not a big trap guy. If you like traps and you want to make your own traps, it has some example traps in here, some simple ones and how to set them up. Everything from a wheel of misery to a snowfall to a hampering web. Those things are all in there for you. As a game master's guide, it's always grad good to have something you can just grab and pull out of the book. Swinging blades like you see in uh, Elder Scrolls Online, etc. So building hazards, this has been around forever. Building creatures, still super awesome. Been around forever. 
It's still there. It's the same thing you had before. Gives you all the attribute modifiers, for everything you need to know to create creatures. And that's what a Game Master guy should do. It should provide you with the rules and the details so you can set up these kinds of things for your world and have the confidence that it's going to be balanced based upon the guys who have an overarching view of the entire game system. That is the strength of this kind of stuff. Very, very useful. Creating spells for them, etc. I'm going to burn through this a little bit faster here. Strike damage. Wow. Imagine that. You make a level 7 new enemy that's kind of like a, a, a lieutenant of a major enemy. He's level 7. You want him to have, do you want him a moderate or low type of a strike damage? Like, is it going to be 2d8 plus 8 or is it 2d6 plus 6? You know, you have average numbers in there too versus higher numbers. That's really, really useful. And spell DC, attack modifier is great. So at this point, you can probably tell that, yeah, this Game Master guy looks like he has everything I need, or you're thinking to yourself, I already have most of this. So if you already have most of this, you probably don't really need it. But if you're just getting in the game and you want to check out the remaster, you want to own the book, you will find that everything has been put in here that needs to be in here and more. I believe there's more information put in here than there was in the previous Game Master guide. And that's always a big bonus. So as we go down, we get past building NPCs and everything you need to have here. Class roadmaps is really nice. Then you finally get to this Age of Lost Omens section, uh, like I mentioned before. And you can just, you know, it, this stuff is everywhere. I mean, it's everywhere. Thankfully, you know, it's not 400 pages of the same thing we've read for years and years and years. It's just a brief little, you know, highlight. If you don't know anything about the game world, this is a teaser because they do a lot of books about the world of Lost Omens and they do a lot of adventures and path, adventure path. Everything they do is in this world. So I completely understand why they're constantly kind of dropping it in here and trying to mention it to you. If you didn't have this, you'd be like, where do we play? What's the game world? You would complain about it, right? But for us who have all the books and every single book has this kind of stuff in it, it gets repetitive. But that's okay because it's there for a reason and it's inspirational, right? And it has good artwork in it. Not amazing artwork, but good artwork. So you can tell the difference between what a leashy looks like versus cat folk, et cetera. And it has the religion, all the different gods like Desna, Asmodeus, and this kind of business. So that's fantastic. Now we get into this other section. I want you to get past the settlements and all that kind of whoop-de-doo. You get to the plains and the outer plains, which is really useful because I tell you what, no person is going to play any tabletop role-playing game without going off in some silver sword chase against Gith Yankee or traveling across the plains or going to hell like in Diablo 1 and 2, etc. These types of things are here for you. It's their twist and take on the classic D&D &D uh, different types of planes, which is good. So in the Pathfinder universe, you know, you can still have a plane of air and an elemental planes and things like that, but they have things like plane of metal, you know, and some other weird ones like the void and the first world and the ethereal plane. So it's different, but it's the same. If you've been around since 1977, you've seen this before, but this is being restated clearly for the Pathfinder universe. And that's fantastic. Um, so that has a whole section on that. Then you finally get to the subsystem section and uh, I'm not a big fan of this, but it's here, right? It includes a section on victory points, influence, research, chases, which happen a lot, infiltration, which is sneaking without being detected, reputation, if you have reputation with certain type of people, get them to trust you and stuff, duels, you know, a duel between you and some other, the mayor of the town, you know, challenges your leader to the duel, leadership, exploration, which is kind of like exploring across a grid and a big wilderness that you've never been to before. A lot of people create a big, massive world, but they got a lot of grids of empty land in between, just like the world of Greyhawk. You're like, well, shit, if someone goes out there, what are we going to do? Just random encounters all day? It's kind of boring. So exploration is a way for you to kind of breathe some life that feels more created as opposed to just uh, vomited onto the table like uh, random encounters and vehicles. This is here. It's a lot. I'm not a big fan of it, but if you need it, it's here and that's great and it's well worked out. And like I said before, having guys who created the game provide you balanced information that should work in the game is good if you would like if you appreciate this. And I could see a lot of people do appreciate this, especially this exploration section. How many people have created a world and described what's happening every mile? No one has done that ever. No one does that. You just need to have that base information to work with. The section on vehicles is fine. Then we finally get to the treasure trove. What Game Master Guide isn't complete with having, an, this is a terrible piece of artwork, by the way, a, a fantastic level of a, a section, a reference section that has all the different magic items you could ever want to do, and how they get used, how they get crafted, etc. Arms and armament, you know, they use runes in this game, it's kind of weird, but they to talk about the type of armor that there is, and some of them are giving you as, as magic items described, like cold iron armor versus elven chain, etc., magic armor. So in their game world, this stuff isn't all that different. 
you know, you don't have lifesaver mail or lion's armor in AD and D or Lord of the Rings Online or anything like that. But you get the idea. It's more fantasy stuff in the fantasy world. So they go through runes and shield runes and weapon runes and weapons, and then they get into alchemy, right? Which is really interesting, especially this is an alchemist class which hasn't been released yet. So you have to use the old version of the game, which talks about elixirs and poisons and tools as well to get past that. Then you, uh, it just keeps going on and on and on with different types of magic items, salves. So if you need a magical scroll, if you need a, a potion of true speech that's going to be an adventure that someone has, be able to tell exactly what someone says of different uh, levels of eloquence, that's going to be useful to you. So I'm going to skip past most of this, go way down here, trappings of power, apex items, companion items, stabs, wands, worn items, gym, art. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. That, these are the things that are fun. <laughs> the tables. Who doesn't like randomly rolling up something and find out you got a brass anklet versus a silver religious symbol? That's always more exciting. And then you get to the real big things, artifacts. Artifacts in AD&D, which is where I come from. Remember, if you're watching this video, whether you found it from a hashtag on YouTube or what have you, a majority of people on my channel are old school A&D and players like like me in their 50s, right? Almost 60 years old. So we're old school guys, and we grew up with AD&D 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and Pathfinder 1 and 2, and Traveler, all this kind of crap. So for us, the most incredible memories we have is doing adventures, going after things like the Rod of Seven Parts, or going for the recorder you've seen, like I mentioned earlier. And then they have cursed items and relics. This is all great. So if you're a game master, you're putting together a world, You've got a world design, maybe you made something in Dungeon Draft or a cartography program, and you've got the exploration section, you've got create your own monsters, you got create your own treasures, you understand how the runes work, you can put magic potions in there, you have special rules for leadership, you have this huge massive resource for creating your own world. And I would say that the book is probably 85% anchored on equipping you with everything you need to create your own world as opposed to running an existing game because there's no sections on combat in here. Like there's no sections on anything except for that DC section we saw earlier, which is how to mitigate and run some challenges and the thing on traps. But none of that's like how to deal with rangers, you know, how to deal with fighters. It, there's none of that opposite side of the table type of advice, which could have been nice. Uh, it would be an opportunity for them to one day do that called the Advanced Game Master's Guide, which goes through all the classes and what people like to do and how to handle it as opposed to just separating it out agnostically. But hey, that would be a really hard book to write, wouldn't it? So after that, we have the treasure tables. Um, that, that's what's flipped through here real quickly. Oh my goodness, you got to have this. Everything you ever need to know, you're going to create your own dungeon adventure. Even if it's just a three-room one-shot, you can put magic items in here. It has different levels, so you know whether you're putting in something balanced or not. And of course, you have a glossary. And their glossaries are really good. If you need to look up something really, really quickly, they're always really well done. This is one thing that Pazzo does really well. They're very thorough at citing page numbers within the body of work that they've written. So you can be way back at page four, and it can mention more on this on page 337, and you can flip right to 337, read one column of text, come back to where you were, and understand completely what's going on. So in summary, all right, let's just highlight this one more time. I'm going to go all the way back to the very beginning. And of course, once again, this is all Oracle license, right? This is right down here in, in the back, which is on file and available in various locations. <laughs> you have to laugh. Um, I'm so excited for this, to tell you the truth, because this is a really strong Game Master guy for someone creating their own world. So with the Orc license, Orc notice, it's going to be neat to see what kind of things people create. Do people create more variant rules? Do they create more classes? Do they create more worlds? Do they create more adventures? Or do they do they all of that? And what happens when everyone starts freely sharing all this stuff? Do we find third-party uh, projects created by Cobalt Press or someone like that who is going to lift something from a community-created item and put it into a high-quality production value uh, published item and just change it a little bit that could be very interesting um, it will be a world of thievery like the music industry people's guitar solos right they're not always the most original guitar solo in the whole world everyone has influences so hopefully what will happen is we see the the, the game worlds evolve and expand in a direction we've never seen before because these rules of what's reserved material versus expressly designated license material is very different than the, o, than the OGL. All right, I promise I was gonna go back to the beginning. So you're thinking about writing the book, you made it this long in the video, you've listened to me talk 5,000 miles an hour, good for you, great. So running the game, really strong, very, very good, especially the whole running encounters, exploration, downtime and difficulty class section. Building the game, a wonderful section on building your old world and how to set up campaigns, really, really strong. Age of Lost Omens, Sure, if you're going to do something and one of their parts of the world, you can look up the religion and the factions, yada, yada. You're going to have that book anyway. It's been re-released like 10 times. Subsystems, eh. Uh, the exploration part is going to be really useful, I personally think. Vehicles is always neat because who doesn't want to have a flying ship going through the air? 
just like they recently released in uh, Neverwinter. Um, the Treasure Trove, you've got to have that too. This book overall is a fantastic tool for a game master who wants to create a world. It's a world creation book more so than how to game master the game. Only section one, right, tells you how to handle and run those types of situations. Everything else is about designing and creating and populating. Okay, cool. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I try to do them pretty fast because they can get pretty long-winded. i got lots to say. Um, but yeah, the, it's a great book. It's fantastic if you are going to be building your own world. If you're just going to run the game as an actual game master, you can probably just use the old DC bo book from the old Game Mastery Guide and how to learn to do that and just use the player core because the player core has everything you need to run a game pretty much. Uh, only the only the special considerations of running encounters and exploration and downtime and DCs is the part that you really, really need. And But, you know, who doesn't want to create their own world? So it's a great book, fantastic resource, well put together. Hats off to the guys doing this. Restating the rules under the ORC license. What an achievement. Have fun. We'll talk to you later. See you, fellas.